Well, some major developments in the war in Ukraine just a short time ago, and as we speak, air raid sirens blaring all across Ukraine. More than 40 Ukrainian cities reportedly being pounded by Russian forces as we speak and into the night. Um, from reports that we're seeing this afternoon, Zelensky's office um, is admitting now critical infrastructure facilities, um, trouble in that in his office, and uh, covering coming under massive shelling. There's a lot of moving pieces that we want to talk about this afternoon, and for that, we want to bring in former UN weapons inspector and Marine uh, Scott Ritter. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So a lot of things to get to. I want to talk about Turkey and Putin. I want to talk about the latest sabotage on the the the, the, the pipeline to Turkey um, uh, there. But I also want to I want to start with what we're seeing right now with this massive amount of shelling. So I guess for people that thought, oh, Putin's first round or second round of shelling, that's done. It's going to be, you know, we're not going to see much. Uh, I guess that is not the case. What is your assessment of this latest uh, massive, massive attack? Well, I mean, my assessment is that the um, the attack on the Crimea Bridge, um, it's an overused term, was a game changer, a, a key critical moment uh, in in this in the conduct of this war. You know, Russia, and, and I've been working really hard to try and get some Russian people to talk to me um, about what it means to be a Russian at war with Ukraine. And um, because in the West, and I think there's a lot of people who are frustrated. They're saying, why isn't Russia just winning this thing? Why is why, why is this taking so long? Right. Um, and and the, the answer is that this isn't a war between enemies. I mean, Zelensky is the enemy of Russia. There's no doubt about that. But the Ukrainian people aren't the enemy of the Russian people. And the Russian people don't view the Ukrainian people as their enemy. This is a civil war. This is the equivalent of a civil war. This would be as if the state of New York went to war against the state of New Jersey. You know, one minute it's summer, you're, you're, you're attending festivals on both sides. New York guys are marrying New York girls. New York girls are chasing New York guys. Um, and the next minute you're at war. And how do you get a New Yorker to want to kill a New Jerseyan just because the governors don't get along? Um, and that's what we're at. And so for eight months, Russia has been struggling with how to accomplish the uh, tasks set out by the special military operation, which deal with the national security interests of Russia without killing the people you love, right. <laughs> I mean, killing your family. And um, they've been struggling with it. And that's one of the reasons why uh, they haven't come up with an adequate response to the uh, massive infusion of equipment by NATO. Um, they, they haven't come up with an adequate response to the Ukrainian counteroffensives. Well, now they have an adequate response. It's called war. And I think Russia woke up to the fact that this um, they couldn't allow Ukraine to kill them by a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you know, nothing Ukraine does to Russia in and of itself is a fatal blow. But when you accumulate enough strikes, uh, you, you begin, you know, Russia begins to look ineffective. And this has a this, this, this has a consequence on the domestic front, which, of course, is the goal and objective of the United States, Ukraine all along to right. create uncertainty right. amongst the Russian people. There's no more uncertainty. They've appointed a new commander, um, General Suv Suvork. Uh, uh, let me just use his nickname because it's easier to say, Armageddon. Um, you know, this is a no-nonsense general uh, who, um, for, for, for the first time, Russia has a unified command to get in the Ukrainian theater. There's no longer four separate commands carrying out four separate campaigns um, being managed long distance out of Moscow. They have a singular leader who is singularly focused on winning this war. And he was told he gets to use whatever means necessary short of nuclear weapons to accomplish this task. And what we're seeing right now is what many people thought we should have seen on day one. That is, if there was a war between Russia and Ukraine, then a strategic air campaign needed to be initiated against Ukraine that knocked out critical infrastructure, electricity, water, communications, uh, to make Ukraine a non-functioning state. That's what you do when you go to war. You make the other state non-functioning. And then once it's non-functioning for a while, you destroy their military piecemeal. And that's the direction Russia is going. But the Ukrainians, there's that old saying, you know, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Russia told Ukraine, do not touch this bridge. Do not touch this bridge. Ukraine touched the bridge. Then they celebrated about it. They had a damn postage stamp made up before the fact, a giant replica of which was outside of a building. People were taking selfies, laughing, cheering. Are they cheering now? No. Ukraine's in an absolute panic right now because they know the reality. They know 
they blew their their for their reserves in this in this offensive in September. Um, they have nothing left. They know that it's virtually impossible for NATO to resupply them. NATO can have all the meetings they want, like the one they just had in Brussels, where they're promising the the, the moon, the sky, the stars, air defense. Good luck getting that air defense into Ukraine, installed in Ukraine with personnel that can operate that air defense. This air campaign is designed to kill the Ukrainian nation without killing the Ukrainian people. But the war is over. It's over. It, all that's left is the suffering. Earlier, you mentioned NATO just a short time ago. We, we heard from Lloyd Austin, Secretary uh, of Defense Lloyd Austin, meeting with uh, the Secretary uh, of NATO, uh, Jen Stoltenberg. You've been critical of Jen Stoltenberg before on our show, saying just shut your mouth because you're going to shut make up. this even worth, worse. Um, but both of them, they were on stage basically saying Lloyd Austin said NATO will not be dragged into a, a, a conflict in Ukraine. And then Stoltenberg said NATO is not a party to the conflict. I almost fell out of my chair laughing. What was your response to this idea that NATO is not involved in Ukraine? Am I in a bizarre well, world? I mean, just just a couple of days ago, Stoltenberg, and it might have been yesterday. I mean, this the, you know things are just happening so fast. I lose track of time. But Stoltenberg got up and gave a speech where he said, um, "A Russian victory in Ukraine is a defeat for NATO." Well, wait a minute. If NATO is not going to get dragged into this conflict, how can a Russian victory be a NATO defeat? NATO is in this conflict. There's no doubt about it. What Lloyd Austin and Jan Stoltenberg are doing right now is, one, trying to backtrack from the stupidity of Stoltenberg. Hey, Jan, if you're listening, shut up. Do yourself a favor. Do the world a favor. Never speak again. But he did, and now they're trying to backtrack it. Because the last thing you want is for Russia, because there's now talk in the inner circles of Russia that – we are at war with NATO, and it's about time that maybe we think about uh, doing things. For instance, if NATO wants to supply Ukraine with these advanced uh, air defense systems, maybe we should consider interdicting them at the source. Ooh, NATO doesn't want that. Um, the other talk is, you know, right now Ukraine is desperate for these long-range attack of missiles. Uh, and there's some in the United States saying, well, uh, like John Kirby, again, another person. Hey, Kirby, I know you're a spokesman. Shut up. Really, shut up. Nothing you say contributes anything meaningful to this discussion. Kirby's like, well, we haven't shut the door on this. We're concerned. Kirby, if you send attackums to Ukraine, Russia will attack Germany, Poland. You want a third world war? Just shut up already. Why don't you take advice from the Secretary of Defense? We don't want to be, we being the United States, don't want to be dragged into this conflict. We don't want to be party of this conflict. Now, we all know that America is a party to this conflict by providing the weaponry, but the United States doesn't want to cross red lines. You know, I believe that we had told the Ukrainians not to hit that bridge, and they did it anyways. And now they're paying the price. And I think the United States is starting to get fed up. They assassinated Daria Dugina in Moscow. The CIA was so, you know, upset about this that they went to the New York Times to, to call the Ukrainians out and say it was the Ukrainian intelligence service that did that. But here's the big problem. Stoltenberg made his statement. If Russia wins, we lose. And then he said, that's why we have to flex our nuclear muscles. That's why we're going to have this nuclear exercise next week. Um, it's an annual exercise uh, to test NATO's you know, nuclear component, which basically is F-35A aircraft using American B-61 nuclear bombs. Um, but why would you do this now, Stoltenberg? Didn't Zelensky just say he wants NATO to launch a preemptive nuclear attack against Russia? And I know everybody said that's not going to happen. But what's Russia supposed to think after Zelensky says, I want a preemptive nuclear strike. And now you're going to hold a nuclear drill, which does what? F-35As take off with simulated B-61 bombs. How do the Russians know it's simulated? And if they ever fly towards the Polish border with Ukraine, what's Russia supposed to think? NATO is literally locked into perpetual you know, brain dead status. You're either in this war or you're out. If you don't want to be a part of this conflict, then start stop pretending you are a part of this conflict. Shut your secretary general up when he says a Russian victory is a NATO defeat. Hey, newsflash, Stoltenberg, Russia's winning. Russia's going to win. It will be a Russian victory. Deal with it. 
Last night on the show, we we covered the story and the angle. Of course, the cradle had reported on this back in March, where you have Al Qaeda and ISIS fighters uh, being paid to fight inside of Ukraine. Uh, the increase in soldiers from coming from Syria through Turkey and going into Ukraine has increased, according to reports. We covered that story last night on the show, and receiving upwards of twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars, Al Qaeda and ISIS who are veterans of the war in Syria that the United States has been using in their proxy war there to fight in Ukraine. I mean, is this surprising to you at all? What is your thought uh, on on Al-Qaeda and ISIS fighters uh, being on the battlefield now in Ukraine? Well, the, the Ukrainians are desperate for manpower. Um, they've, they're, they're burning through their own people. Uh, they're burning through the mercenaries. They're burning through the thousands of Polish soldiers that have been sheep dipped and turned into Ukrainian soldiers. Um, so I think they're opening the, uh, you know, the spigot and taking whatever comes out, whatever yeah. kind of polluted water comes out. When you're thirsty, you got to drink. What, what shocks me the most here, though, is the American taxpayers paying these people. Ukraine has no money, none whatsoever. We're paying the Ukrainian government so they can pay these people. This money is coming from funds allocated to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, who then allocates money to the uh, International uh, Legion, and that's where these guys are coming in. Imagine if I said, hell, I'm gonna write a check for, uh, excuse my language, heck, I'm gonna write a check for um, 1,500 bucks a day to, uh, to an Al-Qaeda fighter. Hey, Al-Qaeda fighter, here's your check from Scott Ritter. The FBI would slam down my door, put me face down, throw me to court, and I'd be thrown I'd be thrown in jail for life as I should be. Why is it okay for the US government to use my money to underwrite Al Qaeda and ISIS? Because the money, I can guarantee you that money's not going into the fighters' pockets. It's going into the organization's pockets. The organization is receiving this money, and they're not gonna simply limit it to supporting that fighter on the ground. That's Ukraine's problem. That money's gonna be used to finance acts of terror globally. You know, not only do we provide Ukraine with Javelin and Stinger missiles that get on the black market and appear, you know, they just, they arrested a guy in Germany the other day with a Stinger missile, ready to shoot down an airplane. That's happening all over the place. We're now actively financing ISIS and Al Qaeda, giving them millions of dollars. We have literally lost our minds. Yeah, and on a day when we literally have new CPI numbers that just came out, which we're going to cover here shortly, and new inflation numbers and food shortage numbers and people, uh, food, sp food prices skyrocketing in the United States to a level that we haven't seen since 1982 uh, for these numbers. Uh, and to know that American tax dollars are, are fun going to fund Al-Qaeda and ISIS fighters on the field in Ukraine uh, is mind-blowing. Um, I want to get you out of here on this, Scott, because I know you got to run and do, uh, do a separate uh, show. So thank you for, for joining us um, on this Turkey pipeline. So we learned this afternoon, according to Russian sources at the Kremlin, the uh, uh, Dmitry Peskov, that they caught saboteurs trying to blow up the part of the pipeline, the Turkstream pipeline, which delivers Russian natural gas to Turkey. Of course, this comes as President Putin was meeting with Turkish President Erdogan about a new uh basically a fuel hub in Turkey. That fuel hub in Turkey meant to deliver um, fuel through Europe and European customers. So this would be an opportunity for those customers that didn't get it because the Nord Stream pipeline was blown up. And now they capture saboteurs trying to blow up the Turk Stream pipeline. Um, give me your thoughts on this and according to what sources you've been talking to on this story. Well, let's, let's back up for a second. <clears throat> when Turk Stream was built, the uh, energy security world was saying what a stupid concept this is that it's a uh, turkey's you know uh, over investing in infrastructure that's useless turkey's vision of becoming a, a, an energy hub is uh, is laughable given the role that germany plays nord stream etc um but the turks did it anyways and the turks have been providing uh, some gas to southern europe but with the destruction of nord stream you know some people thought that maybe the russians would go back repair the pipeline try and resurrect nord stream and bring vitality back into the German hub, because that's what the Germans had become, a hub for Europe, to receive Russian gas and distribute it to Europe. Um, Russia's now sitting down with Turkey, and they're getting ready to help Turkey fix its financial woes. I mean, Turkey's got some serious financial problems, but if you turn Turkey into a major energy hub for a continent desperate for that energy, you are literally 
reviving. This is an AED on the Turkish economy, popping it up. Uh, it's going to restore it. And this is the big card Russia's playing right now. And Erdogan's going for it because he needs the lifeline. Uh, Turkey will become an energy hub, not just for Southern Europe, but for all of Europe. Um, this is huge, which is why you have to ask yourself, who would attack the Turk stream line? And that old legal phrase, we bono. <laughs> Who's going to profit? There's only one person profiting from this entire crisis, and that's the United States. LNG right now is literally 10 times what it was at the beginning of this year, liquid natural gas. The U.S. is positioning itself to be the supplier, trying to replace Russian gas with LNG, American LNG. And we're destroying the European economy in the process. They can't afford these prices. Plus, we can't provide enough of it anyways. Um and so Turk Stream now becomes a viable thing. It's real. It exists. It's there. Um, and the fear in the United States is that Europe this winter is going to turn to Turk Stream and, and say, yeah, we want to tie into that. We want a piece of that action, which means Russian gas will once again be flowing into Europe. We don't want that. So who would attack the uh, Turk Stream pipeline? The United States would attack the Turk Stream pipeline. I can convict the United States in any court in America for the attack on Nord Stream 1 on circumstantial evidence alone. It's the strongest circumstantial case one could ever have. I believe I could get a conviction on a Turk Stream attack, too, because there's only one party that benefits from this. It ain't Russia. It ain't Europe. It ain't Turkey. It's the United States. I know you got to run. Do you think they're going to attack the, the Nord Stream pipeline again now that part of it's back up and running? Well, I mean, it, it, part of it's not running. It's been um, it, it, it can run if the Germans change their regula regulatory structures and the, the EU lifts the sanctions. Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, it, it's very rare that a, a murderer returns to the murder scene twice to kill to kill somebody. Only in the movies do the mafia guys go into the hospitals. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think Turk Stream is very vulnerable. Um, it's, you know, in. How much longer is Europe going to take this? I mean, the fact of the matter is the United States attacked a critical piece of European inf uh, energy infrastructure uh, doing irreparable damage to Germany. Germany will not recover from this. I don't think Germans have woken up to the fact that they're about to be regulated to third nation status because of what happened here. And what now Europe's going to sit by and the only lifeline they have right now is Turk Stream and they're going to let the United States attack that too. When are the ramifications going to come into play? When is the United States going to be held into account? Or is Europe simply a continent populated by sheep who will do whatever the American sheep herder tells them to do? We will see. It seems we already know, the, maybe already know the answer to that. Scott Ritter, um, always great to have you here on the show. Thank you for, for jumping on um, with uh, all of this breaking news this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You bet. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And I should mention that uh, you know some of the, the what we what Scott and I just talked about was obviously the economy, right? So one of the things Scott said was, "Hey, I can't believe like the, the American taxpayers who can't afford right now to put you know groceries on the table are being asked to fund a war, an endless war in Ukraine, where we now know that these you know many of these foreign mercenary fighters are getting upwards of twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a month right. to fight on behalf of Americans. And just today, the Social Security Administration announced an 8.7% increase in payments to those who were on fixed income next year. So that doesn't start until January. It does give people a little bit more breathing room, especially if that population is on Medicare, because those premiums are going down. Uh, the Social Security Administration says that they think the average increase in payment will be about $140 more per month, which is okay, right? It's something that's not nothing. Thing. But when you consider that inflation has raged over 9% right. and has not really gone down, even though we still see the numbers averaging over the last six months about 8.5%. So that gives you a 0.2% more money for what? Taco Bell, $28 of Taco Bell, which was trending today uh, yeah, as yeah. an example of inflation, right? And so, yes, this people will still continue to hurt. We have no idea what will happen to gas prices. Um, so we are being asked to shoulder the burden of this war while also 
hurting inside of our own households. Right. So the consumer price index that came out today, I mean, huge numbers uh, again. So consumers paying more than ever before. Grocery store prices skyrocketing. I mean, the numbers are as high as 1982. So we haven't seen these numbers since 1982. And we know where OPEC is going on these gas cuts and oil cuts. So we know that three, three million barrels a day will be cut. That does mean higher petrol costs, higher gas prices. And of course, we have the sabotage now or attempted sabotage of the Turk Stream pipeline, which could cut off additional gas flows to Turkey and, of course, that entire region. So this idea of creating a Turkish hub for 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 fuel that could end up helping rest of Europe. I mean, Europe is in for a very dark and cold winter. Yes, uh, and the Bosnian story that we've been covering all week. Well, Bosnia had an outlet to the Turk, uh, the Turkish pipe. They were intending to tap into that source. Uh, this is just yet another way to cut off Bosnia from doing what they wanted to do, which was cooperate with Russia. Right, uh, unbelievable. And so, again, we have you know we're going to be watching this very closely over the next uh, few hours here to see what happens and what sort of response we will see from NATO. Uh, 